All right. Um, our agenda for today. So first thing, just uh, a few reminders uh, regarding the project deadline, the Lab 2 deadline. It's currently scheduled at March 31. And that was scheduled prior to the memo that was released na there should be no deadlines within the within the holy week so we i will again move it to um monday the next week okay so that will be um anong date yun? that's march 29 march 29 yes correct so we'll move it to March 29th. So technically you have, well, void naman kasi talaga yung Holy Week. So you, you have, I guess, a few more days to work on it. Um, will that be okay with everyone? Ayoko siyang ibagsak on March 31, which is potentially your final schedule. Um, at the same time, for those who haven't responded yet to the forms, uh, Google Forms, please do so. Um, you've been informed naman na the final week will be on that week. So we're just finalizing which day are we spend uh are we allocating for the exams okay um so yon so potentially the the as of the current status of the survey um the leading availability of everyone is on the last day of the final week which is uh mar um Wait, not hindi pala March 29. Hindi pala March 29, sorry. Um April 5 yung deadline for the project. Okay? It's the Monday after Holy Week. And uh, the final week as of the moment is on April 7. Is that okay with everyone? Wait, sir. So to clarify, the lab that was initially scheduled on March 31 will be due on April on on April instead. April five, yes. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, kasi na binigay ko yung memo na eh binigay na binuv ko yung deadline from twenty seven to thirty first, um due to some of your uh, classmates' request. At the same time, after that email, after that change that uh was uh that happened, nagsend naman ng memo ngayon si um LS regarding the deadlines on Holy Week. So just, um, I guess, unfortunate circumstance from my end, but I guess more time for you. Depends on how you actually would leverage on the extra timing. Uh, uh, I'll be moving the deadline to April 5th for the lab too. And for the, for the, um, for the finals exam, it will happen again on, on that same week. Okay. I, I, I don't think we have much time anymore. Um, sagad na, sagad na yun actually. So I don't want to push it further to April 7, which is currently the date where everyone is mostly available for, for the finals test. Okay. Now for the final exams, um, it will be open for the entire day of whatever date um, na ma-finalize. But you will only have two hours to um, answer the test. So the two-hour timer starts when you click, uh, when you technically start the quiz or the exam on Canvas. Okay? So hindi naman siya two hours lang from 1 to 3 p.m. No. It's open for the entire day from starting at 6 a.m. And um, I'll open it until 9 p.m. for everyone's availability. Okay? Pero beware lang. Don't start it at 9 because I'm not sure how Canvas behaves. If they will cut off your quiz right away after that 9 o'clock uh, time frame. So I suggest um, start your, uh, if you're doing it at the later part of the day, uh, maximum nyo na available to open the exam is at 7 para magamit yung the entire two hours. Okay? Just, that's just to um, avoid any issues on the timing with Canvas. Kay Moodle kasi it will go on. Um, as long as na-open mo siya prior to that closing date, a closing time, it will proceed with the two hours. Pero kay Canvas, I'm not sure. Uh, so, para lang safe for everybody, please um, consider that two hours before the deadline. Start the quiz two hours before the deadline. Okay? Clear ba yun to everyone? Okay. All right. Sige. 
Um, I'll make some of you a co-host. Um, sige. Maybe uh, Matthew and Christine, I'll make you a co-host. So just in case your other group mates will um, still join the, the session today, uh, just please let them in. Okay? Sige, sir. Sige po, sir. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Sige. Um, we'll, I'll proceed now with the lecture for today, which is actually your our last lecture for um, the entire quarter. Okay, so um, earlier this week, I uploaded some materials on two, uh, regarding the overview of the two phases in the first BM, which is data preparation and the modeling phase. So that's actually the introductory um, content for today. Okay, so for today, we'll focus more on the techniques that are being used, are usually used for data science and specifically for, for the business um perspective okay so it will align it on the business side as well right so we'll have we'll discuss clustering versus classification that's pretty much common uh technique or data mining technique no so uh hopefully you'll get um uh, you'll quickly grasp these concepts now the new things uh new things would be the association rule and sequential pattern mining so we'll take a little more time on this one and then if we still have time later on, we'll discuss regression analysis. But if not, um, ito na yung optional um, technique na i-discuss natin for today. All right? So I uh, specifically wanted to discuss association rule and sequential pattern because um, this is what's really, um, I assume, relevant for, for the business setting. Okay? And you'll find out later on. All right, so let's discuss clustering. Okay, without further ado. Now for the clustering, the idea of clustering analysis is to identify the average characteristics of available measures in groups or what we call the clusters. Okay, so in the, the goal of this um, activity is to identify which data points or which rows, which transactions have uh, are very similar to each other at the same time, we want these clusters to have um, low similarity. Okay, so these are the two conditions that needs to be that need to be satisfied: high intra-cluster similarity, meaning within the cluster they are highly similar. Okay, and we also look at it from an inter-cluster. So this cluster itself is has low similarity compared to the orange cluster. Okay, so ganon yung um, the idea of the clustering techniques. Now, there are three common algorithms that are being used okay, when it comes to clustering. Uh, we'll discuss each of them uh, at a high level today since we're discussing a lot of things. Um, yeah, the objective pala of this session is for you to have a high-level idea of these techniques and you would know at least uh, parang, uh, pros and cons. Nila. So when a question comes in, when there's a business question or business challenge, you know right away, ah, this is a clustering activity. Ah, this is a classification activity. Okay? Without even going into detail on how to actually perform clustering and so on. Okay? So, kaya mabilisan lang talaga itong um, session na to. Alright, so again, let's start with K-means clustering. So, some of you, I'm, I'm not sure if any one of you are familiar with the K-means clustering. Okay? So, basically, if it's uh, partitioning and observations into K records in which observe, each observation belongs to the cluster with the nearest center. Okay, so the common algorithm for this one is what we call the Lloyd's algorithm, which is an iteration basically of these two um, approaches, assigning uh, or assigning each uh, data point to an arbitrary center and then update the centers. Okay, so here at the first step, we initiate first kung inland yung clusters na gusto natin. Okay, here we want k equals 3. Okay, so now we have three arbitrary centers. The red center, the green, and the blue. Okay, the next part is we assign each of the data points to, their near, to, the, to the nearest arbitrary centers. So we have this one, which is the out, that's the output of it. Okay, so itong point ito, nearest to the orange center. These points are nearest, are near to the green center. While these points are near to the blue center. Now we update 
the value of the centers. Okay, so from here we put it at the center of uh, that cluster. So ito magbumove siya ngayon to this one kasi isa lang naman yung item niya. So this is now the new center for the orange cluster. The green will move here. Okay, this is the average of all the distances between these um, items. So ngayon siya ngayon yung, siya ngayon yung center ng cluster green. And the blue um, cluster will also move from here to here as the average of all the blue um, blue uh, items. And then using that new center, we will proceed with the iteration again. Assign again uh, yung nearest items to that new center. Okay, As you can see, these two items from green cluster, they are now assigned to the orange cluster. Ito ngayon yung green, ito ngayon yung blue. And these um, approach, these steps, assigning and updating, happens iteratively until the centers become stabilized. Which means that from uh, step K to step K plus 1, um, hindi na nagbago yung center, yung cluster center. So we can consider that as stable already or con it has converged to a stable point. Right? If we put it on animation, now you have four options to look at. Just look at one. So we, we start with um, four arbitrary um, data points. Okay? And then it moves, it updates. Now it's, it's assi it assigns again um, the nearest points. It updates. Okay? And then assign OLED. And then update OLED. Assign, update until there are no more changes. Okay? Now from here, as you, uh, if you haven't noticed yet, all of these data points are actually the same, but we start with four different arbitrary points. Now, that's one of the um, cons of k-means because first, it's very reliant on your initial arbitrary points. Okay, And depending on those points, you could actually come up with different clusters at the end. Right? Second one, second cons of um, the k-means approach is that you need to define your number of k, okay, your number of clusters. Now, in that sense, if you if your business case, from your business standpoint, you don't know how many clusters do you need, then that can be uh, uh, not really a problem, but you know, you have to take that extra step to identify ano ba talaga yung import, uh, ano ba yung uh, gusto nyong uh, value for k. Okay? But as you can see here, it's very quick to implement, assign, update, do it iteratively, and then once it converges, you have your clusters already. So it's also quick. Um, that yun naman yung good thing about k-means. Now, there are different um, variations of k-means, okay? And a more stable clustering is the k-medians because at least from, the med from between mean and the median, much less sensitive si median uh, with extreme values compared to the mean. Okay, so from the mean, uh, from average, when in average yung value, you add another value, it, it could change uh, drastically or not, depending on that value na inad nyo. So mean is, you know, on the sensitive side of, uh, it's more sensitive compared to median. Uh, so some people would want k-medians versus k-means. Okay, mm -hmm. but the same concept, assign and update. All right. That's one of the clustering methods that um, uh, that was mainly used. Okay, the second one is what we call the hierarchical clustering. Okay, in this case, we create a hierarchy or a binary tree of clusters. And compared to earlier, okay, the the usual visualization for this is what we call the dendrogram. Okay, we can see here at the lower right. Okay, we have points, 14 points. We start uh, at 14 points and then we group them until we reach one point or one cluster. Okay, so how does this go? On the first iteration, each data point is considered as its own cluster. So see point one is cluster one, point two, cluster two, so on. Right? Again, iteration, it, we merge clusters based on their dissimilarity measure in a greedy manner. Which means that, depending sa flow nyo, let's say we want to go from point 1 to 14, kung magkalapit agad si point 1 and 2, join agad sila. Okay? Kung magkalapit naman si point 4 at 5, join agad sila. That's the greedy manner. Okay? 
the similarity measure is basically just more on the distance okay with uh, or any similarity approach no um that you can use to compare whether each of these clusters are um can be considered as a cluster okay now it's a bottom up approach as you can see we start with the very granular level and then we come up and create um the number create one big cluster so in this case we don't need to have a value for k right away okay unlike k means okay so from here let's say ah let's try um k equals four okay then let's just cut the dendrogram at this level then we have four different clusters okay let me put the highlight okay if we cut through this point okay so let's say we want k equals four then we cut the dend the dendrogram here Okay. Um, actually, medyo weird yung ano niya. No? Dapat dito siya. Dito dapat yung cutting niya. Alright. Bakit dyan? So, we have this cluster. We have this cluster. This cluster. Ah, okay. Kasi may ganito pala. I, I didn't see that. Okay. Take two. Take two. Erase. All ink on slide. Okay. K equals 4 is here. We cut here. We have this cluster, this cluster, this cluster, and this cluster. Okay? So, right away, you have a, mod, uh, a data model already that, that contains all the possible clusters in the data set. Now, let's say um, I want k equals 2. Okay? Then we simply cut it here. And now we have two main clusters. Now, let's say I want, um, let's say, in about five clusters. Can we make up? Can we make five clusters from here? One, two, three, four, five, six. That's too much. Maybe ito yata yung five. Yung kaya nang ginagawa ko. So that would be this one. One, two, three, four, and five. All right. So ganyan siya. So uh, we don't need to define the number of clusters right away from the start. We can proceed with the modeling itself without identifying the number of k's. And then afterwards, that's when we define the k depending on um, usually business requirement, okay? If there's someone experienced na, ah, we just need five clusters. Okay, then we go for K equals five. Um, they would have a different um, experience. So that is actually based on the domain knowledge already, okay? But the technique itself is there. Now, the last clustering technique that I want to show, ah, okay, ito pala yung process niya. Uh, we measure... The differences between each clusters, we merge the nearest clusters and then we update the distance matrix. Um, so first we measure, so ito yung uh, distance from one point to another. So from point A to A, of course zero kasi same sila. A to B, A to C, A to D, and so on. Now we find the, at the since it's a greedy manner, so yung una munang um, magkalapit na cluster, which is B and H, okay, we identify that, and then we merge this cluster and this cluster. So on next iteration, we have B and H cluster. Okay, so A, C, D, E, F, G, B, H, I, and J. And then you do the same thing. Now you would ask, we now have two points for that cluster. How do we define ko ano ngayon yung distance na ko compare natin within that cluster? That's when we use some linkage criteria. Okay, Sing, um, we have these different criteria um, that defines kung anong distance yung gagamitin nyo doon. So, for example, single linkage. Okay? So, let's say we have um, two points here. Tangat yung drawing ko. But this is one cluster and this is one point. Okay? Kunwari sila yung magkalapit. This is A and this is BH. Kunwari. Okay? From the previous example. Um, single linkage means that we will go for the minimum distance. So, for example, we go for AB and AH. Ano yung mas maliit sa kanila? Okay, let's say A, B yung mas maliit. Then we uh, join via B. Okay, so we join via B. Okay, maximum distance is the other way around. So ano ngayon yung mas, mas malaking distance? So instead of A to B, A to H ngayon siya maglilink. Okay, meron namang, uh, usually naman average distance ang ginagamit. So from here, if we erase this clustering, okay, ayan. Um, if we go for the average, so kukunin niya ngayon yung average ni B and H, which is at around here. Okay? So gagawa siya ng bagong 
arbitrary center dyan, kunwari gitna yan. And then A will actually um, attach to this one. Or dito siya ngayon magka-compare ng distance. Hindi kay B, hindi kay H, but don, on the average of B and H. Okay? And then we have centroid distance and Ward's method, which is the variance of each cluster, which are more um, advanced way of determining linkage. All right. So um, let's take a look at an animation. Okay. Para mas, baka mas, mabis, mas madali siya visualize. So here we can see here that, you know, clusters are, are aggregated as we go up the dendrogram. Okay. And yung, um, from a graph standpoint, okay, from a data point, data point perspective and the dendrogram perspective, we can see here na dun sa animation niya, ginalagay niya sa gitna. So we can tell that this itself uses an average linkage. Okay? So dun niya ngayon kinoconnect. Yun na yung bagong value ng cluster. So ito na yung cluster 1, cluster 2 moves here, cluster 3 is the middle of points 1 and 2. Okay? Um, and cluster 5 is the middle of cluster, ano ba yan? Ang bilis ng animation. Pero yun, average, average. Okay? Next one, ito ngayon yung next. Average na is this one. Average. Okay? And then we combine these two kasi sila magkalapit. Average. And then the average of these two points is this one. So ito ngayon yung value ng cluster 6. Okay? As you can see, it's a bottom-up approach. Okay? Um, it links together via average linking. Okay? Ano ba yung average group? Okay? Just to become, just to be, uh, be more formal about um, the terminologies. It's average group. And then it creates the clusters as we go up the dendrogram. All right. Now, that's the second um, clustering technique. Now, the third one is affinity propagation. Okay. This is usually used if you want to, um, if you want to, um, to create clusters based on their similarity. Okay. Um, it could be similarity in behavior. You know, same people purchasing the same things are similar. Uh, people who purchase similar things are similar people. Okay. Or people who vote for the same groups of senators are similar people. Pangganan. So uh, instead of choosing arbitrary K points, okay, wala ulit siyang required K points. Okay. It just um, relies on the similarity between each points, okay, which is calculating responsibilities. And then the last one is uh, calculating availability. Can that center um, still accommodate for more um, members, right? So this is an animation. As you can see, each iteration kumakapal yung edges as we define the um, the clusters, no? Uh, ayan siya. So we can identify that this group, okay, yung may malalaking, thick, uh, yung may malalaking edges, the thicker edges, they are now part of the same group. Okay, so this is again uh, helpful if you want to measure, uh, if you want to identify customer um, segments based on their, let's say, purchasing behavior or from a subscription basis, yung um, age nila as a subscriber, you, uh, you can use this to compile your, um, to group your different customers. Okay, any questions from clustering? All right. If there are no questions on clustering, again, the main point here is that we are grouping um, each data point, each transaction, each customer um, without identifying really on ano talaga yung grouping nila. So we don't have an end goal yet. So this is why it's called an unsupervised learning. Okay. Uh, unsupervised learning, just to be clear. So we, we don't have a basis na, oh, ito yung sundin mong groups. Okay, mostly kapag ganun, uh, we are working on arbitrary points, not really a specified point talaga, right? So, and then from there, we are looking at their natural um, attraction or natural groupings based on their characteristics, and then we come up with the clusters afterwards, all right? Now, the next one is classification. Now, the difference between the two, okay, is that with classification, it's supervised. So, we have an idea already, ano ba yung end label nila? Right, so if we go go from compare, comparing them side by side, so from clustering, it's segmentation. You are looking at natural associations. Hello, highlighter. 
uh, laser. Okay, we're looking at natural associations and it's unsupervised. It's used for um, credit scoring, insurance risk, um, customer segmentation, um, assuming or filtering missing data. Okay, because we don't we don't know what's the what's uh, the value of that missing uh, cell, right? So we will we can use clustering to identify ano ba yung magiging value ng cell na yon. Credit scoring in a sense that um, coming up with uh, the risk profiles based on historical data. So we don't know yet. The, the, the bank doesn't know yet or insurer doesn't know yet kung sino yung higher risk and um, low risk or let's say medium risk. So from the based on their different, on the behavior of each of their customers, they can define kung ano yung clusters for low, medium, and high risk. Okay? Now, the classification happens when we apply these models. Okay? So for example, when you apply for a credit loan or when you claim for insurance, now they will look at your profile. Okay? Ano bang profile ni uh, Gab Santos? Does it fall under um, does it fall under low risk, mid risk, or high risk? Ano ba yung credit score na bibigay natin sa kanya? Okay, so that's na that's a different case because the company has an idea already of what uh, of how they define a low, medium, or high risk. Okay, personalized offers. Okay, we have a set of we the company or Amazon let's say has an idea already kung ano yung uh, usually binibili ng mga tao. Okay, usually purchased. And then um, when you as a new customer comes in based on your transactions, then they will apply, um, they will now uh, see where you fall under or where you fall into. Okay. Um, and lastly is of course to determine the missing data. Okay. As you can see from the graphical, from the examples, okay, classification, basically you're bin, you're putting each item on bins, on known bins already. Right. So when you combine both, um, clustering classification, there's actually huge discovery power in here, okay? You identify, you can define um, some groupings. At the same time, you can now classify um, incoming data based on those definitions. And then, once you have new data, you can go back to clustering to refresh your definition. Baka nagbago na from 2020 to 2021, um, uh, yung definition nyo of loyal customers, okay? So that's possible as well. So it goes side by side for most cases. Now, since it goes, they go side by side, the differences between them becomes more um, thinner. Okay, usually people get confused what's clustering or what's classification. Okay, but this is um, how we define it from uh, from the perspective of this class. Okay, supervised learning. Okay, we have inputs. It's also called predictors from statistics. Features in pattern recognition. It's also called dimension in data mining. Okay, so we've this we've been working on dimensions for quite a long time for lab two. It's actually part or input to a supervised learning method, and then the output is a response or a target, which are called the dependent variables. Okay, so two simple approaches to prediction. Okay, um, we can use classification, which we will discuss. Re uh, regression later on if we have time. Okay, but for now, let's talk about K nearest neighbors and decision trees. Okay. All right. Um, bago muna yan. Let's move forward. Okay, K nearest neighbors, given a sample query of X, okay, sample point X, the label or score of X is defined by the most frequent label of the K nearest neighbors. Okay, so for example, if we define K equals three, then from that point, which is the star, we identify the three nearest points uh, around it. Then from there, um, uh, majority of these labels, let's say from here, we see that majority of the three um, points is classified as class B. Then we will assign this new point to class B. Okay, get your assignment. Niya. However, if we increase the number of uh, if we change number of K, okay, now K equals six, we are considering six points. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Uh, in this case, may iba ngayon yung classification niya. So the classification of this star will become class A because majority of this of these six points belong to class A. Okay. So I, we see here that uh, the cluster, the, the, the classify, classification of uh, that query of that point depends largely on the number of k's okay 
uh, or the the uh, the number of k that is being set. In that sense, it's effective if there's a large training data, but at the same time, it's also dependent on very dependent on historical data. Okay. Now, the weakness of this one, okay, it's a very resource-consuming algorithm because we are now considering a lot of points as you increase a k. A larger k makes boundaries between classes less distinct. So if you can see here at the lower right, a 15, k equals 15, okay, um, na, na medyo hindi na defined yung boundary between the orange and the blue clusters. There are a lot of blue um, data points that are under the orange cluster. There are still a number of orange data points on the blue cluster side. Okay. Meanwhile, well, if, if we look at a one um, nearest neighbor, yes, we can define very greatly what are the clusters nila, but it, it will it can it can be a very resource consuming algorithm because now we are looking we are taking into consideration um, all data points here. Okay, um, the robustness depends on k and the distance formula used. You can use dif different um, similarity measures. Okay, that also will affect your um the robustness of your k and n okay and accuracy can be highly degraded with the presence of noise or irrelevant features okay so since we are looking at distance formula that's the basic uh, approach here um if there are a lot of noise around let's say this blue cluster there's a lot of orange clusters uh orange points here okay then it the accuracy can be affected as well um we can now consider if this is an issue when you're performing KNN, then you can consider more um, advanced class uh, classification techniques, okay? Like DB scan. Um, a DB scan is one of the um, more improved version of the KNN because now it talks about um, density. We're looking at the more of a 3D aspect of data in that sense. Okay, but in this case, you see here the weaknesses of the KNM. It's very dependent on K, okay, um, K, um, and also the distance formula. And if there's a lot of noise around that specific point, it can affect the accuracy of your um, classification activity. Now, the next one, aside from KNN, is decision trees. Okay, it's pretty much uh, straightforward. Okay, we have different branching of rules. And then based at the based on these branching, we get the label afterward. So let's say uh, if you want to play golf, is it windy? Yes. Then we, we go to this second level of decision making. Is the outlook sunny or overcast? Then uh, we look into humidity. If the humidity is low, then we can play. If it's high, um, last decision, I guess this is don't play. Okay. If it's windy and outlook is rain, don't play. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, now from a data set perspective, okay, we have these different scenarios. Okay, the outlook is sunny, the temperature is ito in Fahrenheit, humidity 1, 2, uh, windy, yes, no. And this is the classification. This is the label that we are looking at. And if you run this on, uh, let's say, rapid miner or other uh, analytics tools, you can create uh, this kind of decision tree, okay? From to play or not play, um, if the outlook is sunny, okay, um, it says do not play, okay? But if humidity is one, then you can play humidity two, do not play, okay? If the outlook is overcast or rain, um, I'm not sure why it says play, okay? But maybe because of the data itself, in yung, uh, in yung, um rules niya, okay? Now, when it comes to uh, running decision tree classification task. Okay, we usually involve three induction algorithms. There are a number of algorithms that can create decision trees. Okay, so first we get a training set. Okay, uh, we use that to create the tree and we come up with a decision tree model. And then we apply this model into a new test set so that we can deduce. Ano yung classifications natin for these different scenarios? Will we play golf or not play golf? Okay, so there's a learning phase, the training phase, and there's also the testing phase. Now, the advantages here, uh, as you can see earlier, it's straightforward. The visualization itself is very, vis uh, 
is very easy to understand because of the tree output. And it's, it, it's fast at classifying unknown records. Okay? It's also easier to interpret, especially for small size trees. And it doesn't require domain knowledge that much. Okay, because we're dependent on the historical data, which is actually a real data already. And it's also useful for all types of data. But now the weakness of decision trees is that it's very sensitive to the first split. Okay. Um, if we go back here, okay, the decision, the tree induction algorithm can choose or can start their split uh, using temperature. It can also start with outlook. It can start with humidity. It can start with windy. Okay, and it depends on wherever they start, the output or the break the, or the branching of rules can also change. Okay, um, it examines a single field at a time. So if there's huge amounts of data, then it can be slow. Okay, and it's also prone to overfitting because it will base their decisions on your. Um, on your training set, okay? And if your test set is very, um, has a high variance compared to your training set, then um, accuracy will change as well, okay? Are there any questions so far with classification? Okay, pa kayo? Yes, sir. All right. So yeah. Um, all right. So the next one would be the association rule mining. Okay. So now we have we're done with classification versus clustering. Okay. Class clustering, we are looking at their natural um, associations. We don't know what the, these associations are um, yet as a uh, as a start. And that's our goal for that activity. Okay. Now, for, or for classification, we have an idea. We have a definition already of what um, play and don't play. We have an idea of who's churning and not churning. We have an idea of um, ano ba, who's buying and not buying. Okay? And then we just uh, apply that um, estimation or that prediction to the new data sets. Okay? So, yun yung differences nila. Uh, we we go now to association rule mining and let me start with a quick story. Okay, we only have around 20 minutes left. Okay. Um, this is a typical story for um, market basket analysis. Okay. Um, there was one big retailer that sees association between diapers and beers. If you've heard of a story, you this must be familiar, this should be familiar with you. So um they started investigating further on the demographics and purchase trend of this pair. And they found out that this pairing usually occurs on Friday afternoons and bought by young American males. So when they were left over the weekend with the kids, you know, they have, they will purchase diapers. Okay. So that they, so that they slumber collab, those babies. At the same time, they will drink beer for other reasons, maybe. Okay. So it's then concluded that these new fathers are stocking up both diapers and beer for the weekend when they are usually at home. Okay. So the specific profile drives the purchase of diapers and beers. Okay. Um, the next one is about Target. Okay. Uh, I think I have introduced the story where they look into the purchases of all the known uh, pregnant uh, uh, customers. Okay. And from there, they saw some associations between their purchases, and then they can predict uh, whether uh, a customer is a family is pregnant or not. Okay. Now, because of this, um, they will now start sending out coupons regarding for, uh, uh, maternity products, um, and then uh, may some father na nagtataka why her daughter um, is receiving these. Um, different uh, coupons. Okay, so he was actually very much ready to sue Target, but in the end, the daughter actually um, disclosed that yes, she is preg she was pregnant. Okay, so uh, that was quite a buzz in the industry, both in retail and um, data mining or analytics side, because again, uh, you can see the power of analytics here, but at the same time, it also um, traverses that, that, that ethical uh, boundary already. 
Okay? So yeah, siya medyo naging buzz. Now, the point here is that we're working on an uh, association analysis, okay, or co-occurrence grouping. So we are discovering interesting relationships or associations hidden in large data sets, attempt to find associations between entities based on transactions involving them, searching for combinations of items whose statistics are quote-unquote interesting. So why are we doing this from a business standpoint? We want to increase revenue from cross-selling and affinity positioning. So if we know that diapers and beers um, are highly bought on Fridays, then maybe Thursday night we will change the layout of the store and put beers and diapers closer to each other. Okay? Or let's say um, at the end of the cashier, the cashier sees a young American male with beers or with, uh, with diaper, then he would suggest, oh, maybe you need, um, I don't know, diaper, or maybe you need a beer for the weekend. So they can do some cross-selling to increase the revenue sales. Um, it can also be an increase of customer loyalty because you're, you're enhancing their consumer experience. So people who really wanted these two pairings would find, ah, look, these two pairings are available um, to me already. So that's a good custom, consumer experience. Uh, and that's a plus point for the retailer. Okay. And it could also reduce shipping costs because, you know, you can uh, purchase or can bulk purchase these two um, or the usually bought pairs of items. Okay. So the data mining task here, if you want to do association analysis, is what we call the association rule mining. Okay. It's also called market basket analysis for um, if uh, for uh, some business terms, right? So the goal is to identify what products tend to be purchased together okay, or consequently purchased if we're looking at purchase drivers. Now, there are two key issues here. Okay? It can be computationally expensive because we are looking at a huge um, data set. We are looking at every item um, being bought per transaction and we're not just involving one store, but we're involving a lot of stores and for a huge range of dates. So it can be computationally expensive. Um, and maybe weird patterns can simply appear by chance. Because initially, those rules don't really mean anything. Okay? Unless we start interpreting, uh, we do some further experiments to interpret those rules. Okay. Now, from the data set perspective, we can start with a binary representation. So each row here is a transaction. Okay, if it has a bread, one, milk, one, diapers, zero, 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 zero. So it's a binary um, value. It's a true or false. Okay, transaction two or basket number two has bread, has diapers, beers, eggs, cola, uh, and so on. Okay, um, this can be considered to be the simplest view of a real market basket data. Okay, but you might want uh, to consider as well the quantity of items sold, unit price, cost of goods sold, or sequence. Okay. As you can see here, it's just true or false. It doesn't really read on the quantity itself. Baka naman limang bread to, tos dalawang milk lang, or um, the other way around, limang milk, but dalawang bread, um, and so on. It doesn't see that way. It just looks whether there's bread, bread or milk in that specific basket. Um, this is an entire transaction from a customer, okay? And we can define different item sets. It could be bread and milk, milk and eggs, diapers and beer, bread, milk, and cola. Okay, so these are the different item sets. It can be zero or more items chosen from the set of all items. Uh, it's what we call the item set. And support count refers to the number of transactions that contain a particular item set. Okay. Now, um, how does how do the rules look like? Okay, it's usually, they usually, when you run association rule mining, it will output these rules for you. An A, arrow, B. Okay, A is the antecedent and B is the consequent. Okay, S uh, is the support or how often a rule is applicable at a given data set. And C is confidence determines how frequently items in B appear in transactions that contain A. Okay, um, we can have the formula here, number of A union B over total transactions N, okay, or the number of A over B um, divided by the number of transactions with A. Okay, so para siyang coverage din. So ganun yung uh, mathematical side niya. Okay, let me try to skip this part. 
let's see, let's go through it na lang. Okay, so how do we use support and confidence? So they are the measures of interestingness. So if you, um, you've seen earlier, right? Uh, we are looking at statistics that are quote unquote interesting. So we will be looking at support and confidence. Support is used to eliminate uninteresting rules and confidence defines the reliability of the rule of how well we can depend on the rule happening in our transactions. So a rule um, or support with very low, a rule with very low support may occur simply by chance. Okay, low support rules may be uninteresting from a business perspective. Confidence, a rule with higher confidence, most likely it is for B to appear in transactions that contain A. It can also provide an estimate of the conditional probability that B is in the set of transactions, given that these transactions have A in it. Okay, so the higher the confidence, the higher the conditional probability as well that B is there given A. Okay, um, just a word of caution. Okay, causality may be evident, but not always the case. Okay, so we are simply looking at association here. Okay, para siyang um, correlation is not causation. Okay, so you may need to perform more or further experiments to derive causation. And that is the sequential pattern uh, mining that we will be discussing. If we still have time. Okay, this is an example of market basket analysis running in rapid miner. So we retrieve the market data, we transform it into binary data. And then FP growth is one of the algorithms that will um, help us identify the interesting rules. And then we create the, the association using those interesting or highly relevant rules. Okay, so other terms. Okay, other terms to describe association rules. We've discussed coverage and support. We will uh, uh, support and confidence. Okay, coverage is simply how many baskets have A. Okay, and then support is how many baskets have both A and B. Confidence is how many baskets with A's have B's. Okay, so, okay ba yun? so may, may uh, conditional probability happening there. Um, if you look for the formula, that's uh, that's it. So the probability of A or A over N transactions. The support uh, A uh, support is the item sets that have A and B all together in that specific transaction. Confidence is the probability of B given that there is A in the transaction. Now we have these two um, remaining metrics, the lift and leverage, um, which we will discuss later on. Okay, but first let's have an example. Okay, suppose we have eight transactions on three items. Maliit lang muna tayo. We have A and B, A, apple, B, banana, C, carrot. We want to look at A, um, A consequent B. Okay, so these are the different transactions. Transaction one is A, B, C, A, B, A, C, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. Right? If we look at each of the metrics using those formula from earlier, okay, we can find that the coverage of A is five out of eight. There are five baskets uh, containing um, A out of the eight out of the eight baskets. Now, if we look at support, we are looking at at Baskets having A and B. So that's A and B, one, two, and three. That's three out of eight. Confidence, okay? Now we will divide the support by the coverage. So 0.375 and divided by 0.625, which is 0.6. Okay? Um, the lift and leverage, if you follow the same formula, that's 0 0.96 and 0 0.015. Okay? So yan yung computation niya um, very briefly from these um, quick uh, from these small data sets. Now, what, how do we use the lift and leverage? Bakit siya binabasa din? Okay, so lift and leverage describe the relationship between the antecedent and consequent. So this is where these definitions are coming in. If we have lift greater than one and leverage greater than zero, that means those products are complementary. Okay, if it's one, lift equals one or leverage equals zero, they are independent. They are not really, um, you know, there's really no relationship between them. But if the lift is one and leverage is zero, uh, less than zero, lift is less than one, these products are competing, okay? So now, using these interpretations, okay? Let's go back to the earlier. Um, what do you think is the relationship between A and B? Are they complementary? Are they uh, independent or are they competing? 
maybe let's look at the chat. Okay, so we have a lift of 0 0.96, leverage is negative 0 0.015. Okay, and using these interpretations, okay, yeah, so it answer chat. Huh? Okay, we have one answer from Kyle. Lift is equal to 0 0.96, leverage is negative 0 0.015. Okay, using these interpretations, ano ngayon yung relationship ni apples and bananas? Okay, may babang sasagot aside from Kyle. Are we relying on competing now? Okay. Majority says competing at least four of you says competing okay so we can see here that it's actually they are actually competing products right so from here from the association analysis as you can now identify if these products or um, pairings are complementary independent or competing as well okay we can see from the score measured nearing towards independence chat so you can probably put some ranges as well um if they are borderline competing or independent, maganan, right? So that's actually depending on the business rules. Um, we only have four minutes left for this session. Um, I have the last uh, thing to um, discuss is sequential pattern mining. And I have a seven minute video here. Will that be okay with everyone? Okay. After this, we're done with the session. For those who are not available after the two o'clock, if they if you have any classes, you are free to go. But um, hopefully for the rest of you, you can stay for a little bit for just this quick um video on sequential pattern mining. So the difference here is that earlier from association rule mining, we're looking simply at associations um inside a transaction. Okay, but now we will be looking at transactions on a specific sequence. Okay, we're not considering the time that they were being purchased. Okay, now we can, from here, we can see whether we can forecast in the future whether A and B will still be bought together um, or will it involve other products. Okay, so um, I don't see any um, disagreements on the chat. Okay, but again, if you have any class after this, after by two o'clock, you're free to go. It, the session is recorded anyway, so you can revisit this part um, uh, again. Okay, but let me just go through this video. It's a seven minute, seven minute video. Okay, let's do it. Can you guys hear the audio? Yes, sir. First, we are going to discuss sequential pattern and sequential pattern mining, the concept. So the first thing is we should say sequential pattern mining is very useful, has very broad applications. One application could be in customer shopping sequences. For example, you get a loyalty cards for your you know, shops. You may want to see maybe one customer likely going to first buy a laptop, then a digital camera, then smartphone within six months. If this forms a pattern, you may be able to, to try to do some kind of advertisement to other similar customers or you know, serving some new incentive for this customer. Like a medical treatment from sequences, natural disaster like earthquake happening, it may have some sequences of natural and also human phenomena. Science engineering, a lot of things are processes. They evolve along with time. Similarly, stocks, markets, they, they have some kind of duration sequences. We have a lot of click streams, calling patterns for telephone and other things forming sequences. Even for software engineering, the programming execution form sequential patterns. The biological sequence is very, very useful for analysis, like DNA sequences, protein sequences. So we'll see trying to get sequential patterns out of those very big vast applications 
could be very useful and important. Actually, we can distinguish transaction databases. Usually, may not be important to look their time effect. Sequence databases, they have timestamp uh, attached with it. Time series databases, usually the time things happened actually is along the even or equivalent time intervals. Sometimes it's very consecutive. Then for sequential patterns, actually there are two kinds. One is gapped, another is non-gapped. The gapped pattern means you do allow to have gaps within those patterns. The non-gapped patterns means you will not allow these patterns, the sequence, everything is important. The consecutive is important. If you have gap, you have to treat them very seriously. For example, for shopping transactions, probably you don't care customer in the middle of buying some other things, so it's not important to study the gaps. Click stream, sometimes you may say, you know, some click stream you may care about gaps, some you probably do not care about gaps that much. For biological sequences, in many cases you do care about gaps. So the protein sequence or DNA sequences, if you insert many things in the middle of the two DNA sets, sometimes you may completely change the function. So let's look at the customer shopping sequence as a major example to study how to do sequential pattern mining. Sequential pattern mining essentially is you give me a set of sequences. The algorithm is trying to find the complete set of frequent subsequences satisfying certain minimum support threshold. Let's look at this example. We have a sequence database containing like a four customer shopping sequences. Okay, what's the meaning of this? We look at this particular sequence. This sequence, the parenthesis means this one is within the same shopping basket. Then after that, you get another one, AB, that means this AB, you know, following EF. But AB is getting together at the same time. Similarly, DF getting together but following AB. And then C, then B, okay. That means each one of these you can think is an element. It may contain a set of items or you call events. Then this one event may follow another one. The items within the event, the order is not important because they are in the same shopping basket. But uh, for our convenience, we can sort them alphabetically. Then what is subsequence? Actually, any substrings within this one, you probably can see here, the subsequence, you may have a gap. For example, you said you can have A, you have BC, BC actually you chop this A, you can chop complete AC, then you get a D, uh, you can chop uh, one F, you can get a C. So this one is a subsequence of this longer sequence. Then sequential pattern mining. The sequential pattern essentially is, you, if you set a support, like a minimum support is two, that means at least the two sequences contain these subsequence. You find those subsequence, this is a sequential pattern. For example, A, B getting together, then C. In this sequence database, this is a pattern of support two. So sequential pattern mining algorithm is you try to develop algorithms which are efficient, scalable, and these algorithms should find a complete set of frequent subsequences, what we call sequential patterns, and also should be able to incorporate various kinds of user-defined constraints. For sequential pattern mining, actually, every property, the property we have used uh, in frequent pattern mining still holds. For example, if we say a subsequence F sub 1 is infrequent, then any of its super sequence cannot be frequent. So that's almost the same idea as Apri. So based on this idea, we actually can develop lots of algorithms. One representative algorithm called GSP, Generalized Sequential Pattern Mining, uh, developed in 1996. Another one is a vertical format based mining called SPADE, uh, developed in year 2000. 
The third one we're going to introduce is pattern growth method called prefix span developed in year 2001. And uh, then we are going to study mining closed sequential patterns called closed span. Finally, we are going to discuss constraint based sequential pattern mining. All right, we're not going to discuss. Okay, we discussed yun sa sadili niyang um, online lecture, but things that was mentioned earlier. So they mentioned about a priori. Okay, uh, let me just go through it very briefly because we did not discuss it. So it's also part of the um, association rule mining. Okay, so you can see here if an item set is frequent, then all of its subsets must also be frequent. Okay, so for example, if we have all of these item sets, okay, a, b, c, d, these items we have a b a c a d a e b c and so on a b c a b d a b c d a b c e and the one big item set which is a b c d e okay these are all the item sets okay uh, a zero item set one item set two item set three four and five item sets okay um if this c d e is a frequent item set then everything underneath that is also frequent Okay, so as you can see here, the C, D, C, E, D, E, C, D, E, and null are all frequent. Okay, conversely, it's also true. Let's say A, B is considered infrequent. Then everything above that, everything, uh, all the super sequences above it, okay, are now uh, considered infrequent as well. Okay, so from A, B, if infrequent siya, A, B, C, A, B, D, A, B, E, A, B, C, D, A, and so on, up to A, B, C, D, E, are all infrequent. Okay, so this actually helps in limiting the number of um, item sets that will be uh, observed from both um, from both uh, association rule mining and also the sequential pattern mining. So the difference between the two is that when we look at uh, market basket analysis, we're looking into the specific market uh, specific baskets of each or specific transaction. Whereas when we look at sequential pattern mining, we are looking at each transaction, okay, happening uh, consequently, okay. So getting in difference nila in terms of the objects. One, we look at the basket itself, okay. Let's say basket ni uh, ni Nicole, basket ni Christine, basket ni uh, sino ba iba example. Let's say uh, Christine, ni Matthew, okay. Different purchases nyo. We look at them individually. Ano yung common pair common pairs. Okay, but with sequential mining, we will look whether na una ba si Matthew mag-purchase, na una ba si Christine mag-purchase, na una ba si Nicole mag-purchase, and so on. Okay, so we can forecast, we can foresee whether this item sets will happen also in the future. Okay, ganun yung um, sense ni sequential pattern mining. All right, now that's a lot of things discussed today. We are uh, over time by almost 10 minutes. The last thing that I want to show with you is, sim which I will also attach in the um, recording, is a, uh, a presentation by um, Dr. Reina Reyes, okay? uh, which combines both uh, market basket analysis and um, uh, what we call this, also similarity uh, measures. Okay? So I will attach this document uh, together with this recording, and I want you to go through it, uh, and we'll probably just look through it and see how market basket analysis and also um, clustering techniques was used in this case study. Okay, so if you're not familiar with Dr. Rina Reyes, she was um, the renowned scientist who was able to prove Einstein's uh, theories. Okay, and now she's with uh, UP Diliman uh, National Institute of Physics. All right. Any questions? We're over time by 10 minutes. I'm sorry about that. I will attach this recording in Canvas. If you have other questions, um, please feel free to uh, message me on Canvas and email. Uh, regarding the project, again, I will move the deadline to April 5th for Lab 2. Okay. Um, and the finals will be determined as we get more responses from the um, from the entire class, okay? Any questions regarding the topic? Or lutang pa kayo? 
That's a lot. That's a lot of content. Understandable, naman yun. Okay. Sige. If there are no questions, I'll end the class now. Um. Um. Bef well, before I end the class, thank you so much for the quarter for bearing with me and all the chaos that is happening around. Um. But thank you as well for uh, yeah, for being in this class, and I hope to see you uh even after this quarter. Okay. Sige. Thank you so much. Um, for those who have, okay, let me stop the recording.